I want to start today with a confession, or maybe it's an admission, I don't know, but it's the truth. You can't handle the- I spend an unholy amount of time worrying that I'm just behind in life financially, that I'm not living up to my potential, that I've wasted years of my life. And the funny thing is, I know it's ridiculous. I know on paper that I've done well, but still, this feeling persists. This thing. It's gonna follow you. It's like in this mountain climb that is life, I'm just clambering to the rock face for any foothold. While to my left and right, countless others just glide on past me all the way to the summit. What worries you, masters you. Now I am sick of worrying. So I went looking for answers, and what I found was startling data on what doing well financially actually looks like. And more importantly, I found answers to the questions of why I feel like this in the first place. Today, I wanna share with you what I found, because I think that some of you probably feel the same as me, and I want to make you feel better. You need to get rich for extraordinary success. I am a millionaire. Billionaires are a trillionaire. Get rich, rich. Power and capital, all of this stuff. I've broken this down into four sections that look at the four key areas of your finances. All timestamp below for you. We're going to be looking at earning, saving, spending, debt. But first, because I'm annoying, I want to tell you a story. Have you ever seen a documentary called The Dawn Wall? A quick Google search and the description is as follows. Legendary free climber Tommy Caldwell tries to get over heartbreak by scaling the dawn wall of El Capitan. It's a climbing documentary. We're running with this whole mountain thing, but trust me, it'll make sense, I hope. So Tommy Caldwell is arguably one of the greatest climbers that's ever lived. But hold on a second. There's two of them up there. This guy right here. Kevin Georgeson. And while Google might not see Kevin, we do. Kevin's position on the rock face and the recognition he gets from Google are a perfect example of the same forces that cause us to feel crap about ourselves. We live in a world where the best get the glory, where second place is just the first loser, where the individual achievements of the exceptional are just held up for all to see, and so obsessed with extraordinary are we that Kevin, who is exceptional, doesn't even get a mention by Google because he just isn't quite as good as Tommy. Nothing highlights the gulf in skill between these two climbers more than pitch 15. You see, the dawn wall is made up of 32 pitches. Each pitch is the length of a rope. And pitch 15 is the hardest, thought to be impossible. Yeah, this is a pipe dream, man, come on. Tommy conquers this section with relative ease, but Kevin just can't. Each time he slips, over and over again. So the decision needs to be made, does Kevin abandon his attempt to climb this face and just support his friend, the better climber, in achieving his goal? Now we're gonna come back to this story in a minute, but first of all, let's just recognize that both of these guys are exceptional. But next to the truly special Tommy, Kevin is starting to look and feel very average. Now I'm not calling myself exceptional, but I guess it's similar to how I feel. Below average, especially compared to the exceptional. All these 20 something year old millionaires who are forced in my face every time I open a device. So let's start today by looking at what average really is, shall we? Our first section is called, how much I earn. If we look at right now in today's world, the median income is estimated to be $9,733 a year. But there is huge variations in this figure. Around 1 billion people on the planet live on less than $2 a day. And around two fifths of the planet live on less than $6 a day. But look, I get that you know that the UK or America are good places to live from an earnings perspective. And really comparing the Western world to the rest of the world isn't fair because of cost of living and stuff. So let's just zoom in a little bit. The average UK income is £27,756. Enjoy the money. I hope it makes oh you very God. happy. Now we know that averages don't really mean much, but get this, there was a study done and they asked Brits earning between 80 and 100K what they felt about their income. And 60% of them said they felt that it was probably about average. Now you might laugh, but it kind of reminds me of this party it was at once. It was a nice party. I pull into the drive and there's just a fleet of supercars. We're talking Ferraris, Lambos, and this powder blue Bentley, which stood out to me. Because it was powder blue, and because the owner was getting out of it, some six foot chiseled slab of a man with his beautiful partner. I'm like, right, I'm gonna need a good backstory here. Okay, um, I invented post-its. Fast forward to later in the night and I get chatting to the guy with the Bentley. It's that 2 a.m. kitchen chat kind of vibe, so it gets a little bit heavy. And the guy starts talking to me about the fact that he feels insecure at this party. I always feel like I'm the poorest millionaire in the room. I mean, clearly he's intimidated by my bulletproof post-it note backstory. I remain composed, but internally, that sentence rocked my world. This guy was honestly close to tears, but I can kind of understand now why he was upset. Why do people on 100K a year say that their earnings are average? 
because they're probably surrounded by people earning five to 10 times that. I found this paper called, Is More Always Better? A Survey on Positional Concerns. Someone whose close associates all earn 50K a year is likely to feel actively dissatisfied with their material standard of living if their own salary is only 40K. Yet the same person would likely be content if his close associates earn not 50K, but 30K a year. If you wanna feel better about how much you earn, get some poorer mates. We measure our own success based on those around us. In the past, when our social circles didn't extend beyond our local town, that was fine. You could be a baller in your own world, blissfully unaware of the bigger fish down the road. But now the internet exposes us to the success of everyone, everywhere, all the time. The most successful anomalies are there for us all to see. And the fact is, from a global perspective, you're probably one of the highest earning people on the planet. Most of us will easily spend more on a coffee than a lot of people earn in a day. If we bring this back to the mountain, I'm gonna keep bringing it back to the mountain. <laughs> this is you way up there on the mountain while most of the world just look up at you. But then we zoom out and we see this guy. And now you look bang average, don't you? Comparing our earnings to the 0.01% of the 1% is like comparing your Johnson to the guys on P-Hub. It's only gonna make you feel small. And like they say, it ain't the size of the boat, it's the motion in the ocean. It's not what you've got, it's what you do with it. Which brings us nicely onto our next section. How much do I keep? Maybe it's the rise in the fire movement that makes us all feel like if we're not saving 80% of our income on a monthly basis, we're somehow a joke. What a sad little life. But what is the reality of it? How much are people in the UK actually tucking away of their income on a monthly basis? The answer is not very much. 15% of people in the UK have no savings at all, while one in three people have less than 1,500 put away. 40% of people don't have enough money put away to support themselves for a month in the absence of work. They lose their job, which let's face it, is more likely now than it was before due to recession, and one month later, they're insolvent. Just do me a favor, right? Next time you see a work colleague with a Range Rover and a 400 quid pair of trainers, don't say, why can they afford that? What am I doing wrong? Understand, the answer is nothing. They're just likely part of the 40% of people in this country that blow every penny they earn. And the mad thing is, right, this extends to all income categories. Almost half of Americans earning more than 100K a year are paycheck to paycheck. If you're interested in the raw figures, here are the average savings by age for each age group in the UK. But these averages are heavily inflated by a few super rich people in each age group. I mean, Phil Foden, the footballer, he gets paid 200K a week and he sits right here in this category. The truth of it is that global saving rates are just not that impressive. In the UK, it sits at an average of about 5% on a monthly basis. In America, it's even lower than that. Cost of living, housing costs, shrinking real incomes, and a rise in ownership of luxury goods amongst the middle classes are all contributing factors. Many can't save, they just simply don't have the money, but many can and they choose not to. So if you're watching this and you save above 5% of your income on a monthly basis, you're doing better than most. Now, we just spoke about spending, didn't we? And that brings us on to our next section, how much I spend. Now, I wanna tread very carefully here because there are many people in the UK and across the world that at the moment are borrowing to keep the lights on out of necessity. And I don't wanna sit here and be like, oh, stop buying trainers and you can save some cash. There's plenty of people in the world that that does apply to, but I also just want to recognize that life is a struggle for many out there. And these figures kind of highlight that. The latest data I found in a documentary from Channel 4, which I've linked below, says that a quarter of all Brits are currently borrowing money in order to pay for food and energy. But I also found a separate study that suggests one third of homes in the UK live above their means, meaning that more goes out than comes in. But that data also includes people that have a lot of savings and investments, so it might be a little bit misleading. So let's first of all, just look at the average household budget here in the UK. Obviously these figures are a best guess, but this Nimble Fins article provided a great breakdown. They have everything on here. I'm not gonna go through it all. Here's a quick snapshot of the main costs on screen for you if you wanna pause, but I've linked it below so you can have a look. But the headline is that they estimate that the average UK household consisting of 2.4 people spend 671 pound per week or 2,907 pounds a month to cover living costs. Brits spend the most on transportation, housing, and food. I don't know about you, but I see that food percentage and I think all I spend my money on is food. Dump truck. But what is scary about this is at a glance, the total the average house spends on a yearly basis is 34,884 pounds. That's the monthly figure multiplied by 12. But the ONS reports that the median household disposable income as in the middle amount households bring in after tax is 31,400. And the costs for running a household are rising. Is it any wonder then that one fifth of households in the UK will be classed as in poverty in the next 12 months? I stumbled across this quote while researching this that really gave my head a wobble. I just wanna share it with you. The opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is enough. 
The simple fact is, if you pay your bills on time without using debt to do so, you're doing pretty well financially. Speaking of debt, let's look at debt in more detail in the last section, which is how much I owe. You can probably guess that the figures here are going to be pretty bleak, so I'm just going to cover them really quickly because it was at this point in the research and while looking at these figures that I realised something that kind of changed the course of how I was looking at all of this. We're going to get onto that in a minute, but let's just look at the debt figures first of all. This is all excluding mortgages, by the way. So it should come as no surprise that debt levels have risen in the last couple of years, but the amount is pretty shocking. With the average Brit owing £25,879 in 2021, this is up from 9,246 in 2020. Obviously, this is slightly older data, but it just highlights the impact that COVID had on people's debt levels here in the UK. So I think it's clear that the reality is if you're saving anything, not going into debt and paying your bills on time, you are right at the front of the pack in terms of financial performance, both globally and domestically. But be honest, does that make you feel any better? It didn't for me. We've shown multiple times throughout this video that it's comparison to others that breeds dissatisfaction when we're talking financial performance. So much so that the figures can say you're doing well, but you'll go, yeah, but he's doing better. Where does that come from and how do I solve it? We must first acknowledge that comparison between humans comes from our innate desire to compete. Now, some scholars think competitiveness evolved out of a need for survival. In a time where resources are limited and everything's trying to kill us, if I can outrun you and get more stuff, I'll probably live longer, which is pretty useful. In the modern world, competitiveness is as much essential as it is fun. What would life be without a bit of competition after all? But there is a problem. In the modern world, especially when it comes to our finances, the arena we compete in has just become massive. A 2014 study into the psychology of competitiveness discussed something called the N effect. This is the observation that as we increase the size of the group of people we're competing against, we become less and less effective at competing. Think about it. Football, two teams, chess, two players. In business, your competition are those companies that do what you do. But when it comes to financial performance, who am I playing against? Who is my opponent? Everyone, everywhere, all the time. Our competitive nature and this desire to win has been overwhelmed in a world where there is just constant exposure to other people's success. You won, Jane. I could go on any social media platform right now and just show you image after image of people who at a glance look like they're better off than me. And the issue is, that's just never gonna end. I could buy a powder blue Bentley and still feel like the poorest millionaire in the room. Because if my goal is just to be rich, be rich versus who? Elon Musk? One last study before we tie all this together. This one's by Sander van der Linden. So he wondered if he could use competitiveness to get people to save energy. They did a study at a university where they said, the frat house that reduces their energy consumption the most wins. During the experiment, everyone cut their consumption right down, but as soon as it ended, consumption just went straight back up again. He concluded that competitions by their nature have an extrinsic incentive. What that means is the desire to compete is driven by the promise of external reward. In this case, it was a prize, but as soon as the prize was won, nobody cares anymore. Now, the problem I have is the way I feel about my finances is clearly being influenced by external comparison. We know this because of that study, you know, the whole, if I earn 40K, my colleagues earn 50K, I'm gonna feel bad about my finances, but if I earn 40K and they earn 30K, I'm gonna feel good about it. That's extrinsic in its nature. Now, the issue is though, what is the reward here? To be the richest guy in the room? To be successful? I don't know. And what sort of problem do we think that generates in terms of motivation? I'll tell you what, it creates a situation where you can be doing great by all metrics and still feel crap about yourself because there is no end to it. The paper noted that to really get people to change their energy consumption habits, you need them to have an intrinsic motivator, something inside of them that is bigger than just, I want the prize. But the paper also said, Unfortunately, lots of psychological research has also shown that external incentives crowd out and undermine people's intrinsic motivation. I cannot compete financially with the whole world. I will never win that battle. The arena's just too big. I need to find intrinsic motivation to perform well financially and clearly define what that looks like for me. Then I need to drown out all these external influences that would seek to undermine my intrinsic goals and ultimately just make me feel crap about myself. To give your kids a deposit for a house, to have a million quid in your ISA by retirement so that you can support yourself, to clear your debt so you can start investing. These goals have a more intrinsic focus, to do well financially, extrinsic and completely undermining. I know that sounds really wishy-washy and some of you will be like, F this, I'm going to take on the world. But I've been doing that for 10 years, trying to take on the world. And I promise you, there's always a bigger mountain. There's always a richer millionaire. There's always a bluer Bentley. 
And when your goal is that poorly defined, it just becomes massive. It becomes too big. And as studies have shown us, you actually then become a less effective competitor because of that. Which brings us back one last time to the hero of our story, Kevin, who under the extrinsic weight of the world watching him attempt pitch 15 and the massive task of catching back up to Tommy, who is well ahead of him now, has spent the last three days failing. And now it's time to give up. Throw in the towel and, and support Tommy to the top. Tommy cannot afford to sit there waiting anymore for him. He just needs to push on. You had your chance. You weren't good enough. Kevin now embraces his job in assisting Tommy in climbing to the top, something that has never been done before. Kevin is supporting his friend in achieving greatness as Tommy inches closer and closer to his goal. But a few days later, after completing the hardest sections of climb, Tommy says something to Kevin. I don't care how long it takes for you to get through pitch 15. This isn't a competition. This isn't even about the goal of climbing the dorm wall. This is a story about two friends doing something incredible together. Because I can't imagine a worse outcome than doing this alone. Tommy in that moment removed that extrinsic pressure on Kevin, this massive goal of climbing an impossible mountain while the world watches, and instead just made it about them two. He even threw his phone off the mountain to cut out all the outside world and the external forces that were undermining Kevin's confidence. The media circus. I think he didn't drop it. <laughs> he threw it off. The sun rises on the 16th day. The world still looks up from below, but it's just Kevin and Tommy on that mountain. I couldn't imagine what he must have been going through at that moment. Kevin reaches to the point where he has fallen countless times before. His friend Tommy sits in the tent, belaying the rope to him. A stretch, a foot, Kevin delicately positions his fingers gripping to the rock, inching his way towards the end of the line in what can only be described as a dance on a tightrope hundreds of feet in the air. And with a click, he does it. Yes, Kevin. Can I just say, I love Tommy. What a friend he is. To take a chance at sacrificing his own goal so his mate could join him at the top. But if you think about it, it was this action from Tommy that released the pressure on Kevin. I don't think it's a coincidence that when Kevin was trying to keep up with Tommy, when he was competing and putting that pressure on himself, he spent days just failing. Once that was gone, he nailed it first time. Maybe I can learn from that. After all, I'm not racing anyone but myself. So how did the story end? Well, after completing pitch 15, Kevin dominated that mountain. He's not going to give up. I can't believe that just happened. He did it. Freaking guy actually did this thing. Tommy, he was made for something like this. But for me, it took a long time to get comfortable on the wall. True story, I invented these.